Ferrari Enzo was nearly obliterated in the high-speed crash along the PCH. <laughs> This story involves guns, embezzlement, international smuggling, hookers, blow, stolen cars, and the Swedish Mafia. Living near some of the nation's most expensive real estate, here in California we're accustomed to seeing rich people driving expensive cars. It's just a matter of life down here in Southern California, especially in Orange County. It's no big deal. We're also accustomed to seeing news stories about celebrities driving drunk or recklessly driving, as well as stories about financial misdeeds among the super rich, those kind of things. And they're always fascinating stories. But every once in a while, a rich and shameless exotic car owner makes news headlines for both bad driving and a financial scandal in the same story. Those are the stories that I really like to read. If you remember my video on Johannes Marlium, that was one really good example where cars and corruption intersected and made for a wonderful story and a tragic outcome. This is a story, though, of another individual whose story has all the makings of a movie plot. And I know I've said that before, but this time it's absolutely true. This story involves guns, embezzlement, international smuggling, hookers, blow, stolen cars, and the Swedish Mafia. Swedish Mafia? Hey, check out my meatballs by Zant. Swedish... Where do they hold their meetings? In Ikea? All of that is coming up right after the break. I don't know if you know this, but I actually now have a merch store. And if you haven't checked out the video description below my videos, then you're missing out. Currently, I've got a pack full of movie quote t-shirts, and more styles are being added every month and new items are in development right now. So have a look, see if there's anything you like, and wear it with pride. The link is in the video description below. Pacific Coast Highway, known as PCH, is one of the only reasons to come to Southern California right now. Unless, of course, you like homeless people pooping on the sidewalk and criminals being released from jail 15 minutes after they commit a crime. If you're into that, come anyway. From San Clemente to Malibu, no visit to the Los Angeles area is complete without driving along California's Pacific Coast Highway. That particular stretch of road is absolutely beautiful. It's where all the rich celebrities live and all that kind of stuff. So it's not uncommon to see movie stars and supercars leisurely cruising, maybe to get their pet Airedale groomed or picking up their venti soy vanilla chai tea latte or something like that. But what is uncommon is seeing a Ferrari Enzo split in half with the engine resting in the middle of the road 150 feet away from the passenger compartment. That's a little unusual. You don't see that every day. This is a complicated story, so try and keep up. Here we go. You probably heard something about the Ferrari Enzo crash, but you may not have heard anything about the chap who was driving it, a fellow by the name of Stefan Erickson. And if you're a gamer, you might have heard of Gizmondo, especially if you're around in the early 2000s. Erickson was part of the Gizmondo scandal in which he and his partner, Carl Freer, whose startup gaming company called Gizmondo would lose over $380 million in an unprecedented scam that burned investors from London to Los Angeles. So on the morning of February 26, 2006, it seems that Erickson decided to stretch his Enzo's legs along PCH north of Decker Canyon Road in the pre-dawn hours of a cool winter morning. February in Southern California, we usually don't get a lot of rain, but it is cool. On this particular morning, though, his ego was writing checks his body couldn't cash. Things went horribly awry as the car crested a small rise on the road, and everything went to hell real quick. <laughs> Erickson lost control of the bright red Enzo at 195 miles an hour and quarter to the ECU data, bounced off on a power pole, still doing 162 miles an hour. Well, at least he slowed it down a little bit. <laughs> that impact turned the Enzo into 400 yards of carbon confetti, broken glass and miscellaneous subcomponents that became lawn ornaments for local residents. <laughs> so stuff was all over the place. They had to shut down the road in both directions to sweep up. Sweep, not pick up, sweep up. This happened around 5.30 in the morning. It's still dark here about that time at that time of the year. Everybody was still sleeping and it made so much noise that residents were woken up. People came outside to see what's going on. And they thought it was a multi-vehicle crash because of all the debris. The car's hood actually wound up wedged in the main access gate of some local resident's mansion. 
I wonder if he kept it. And as the sun came up, local law enforcement started to arrive in bigger and in, in greater numbers. Immediately, things got weird as they tried to interview the alleged passenger. And I say alleged because he was really driving the car. Erickson swore, though, he was the passenger, and he told the police that the driver of, of his car was a fellow who he knew only as Dietrich, and that guy had fled the scene. So you give somebody such, some stranger, you just know his first, first name. Here, go ahead and drive the car. There was a third man at the scene, an Irishman named Trevor Carney, who further complicated the investigation. And this gets a little convoluted, so let's get that, we'll get to that in a moment. Additionally, Carney told Officer Hewson from the Orange County Sheriff's Department that he had stopped at the scene to see if anyone survived. Carney stated that he was a passenger in the SLR McLaren that was racing next to Erickson's Enzo. He just admitted to racing. But when the cops arrived, there was no SLR McLaren around and there was no Dietrich. Okay, let's figure this out. The idea that two men would be found at the scene of a single two-seat car accident and that both would claim to be passengers and not drivers seemed kind of fishy. So as you can uh, expect, this was met with skepticism. But the cops decided to conduct a search up the adjacent hillside to search for this mythical Dietrich guy. Of course, they never find this dude. They never located another person of any sort on that hillside and that never panned out. But while Officer Houston was still interviewing witnesses, a blacked out Hummer H2 showed up. Two men in suits jumped out and started flashing badges. Those two men claimed that they were with the Department of Homeland Security and they claimed jurisdiction over the accident scene. Now the cops started to get a little suspicious of these people. They were self-proclaimed DHS agents and they didn't actually show any badges. So as the cops started asking questions, they learned from witnesses at the scene who said that they had seen that the Enzo was speeding all around West LA and Sunset just a few hours early. A car like that gets a lot of detention. So they gave the guy a breathalyzer test, which was about two hours after the crash, and it was revealed that Erickson was still over the legal limit even though two hours had passed from the time of the crash. Not good. Weapons were also found in the car, and this complicated the situation further because Erickson was a convicted felon and a foreign national, and neither are allowed to have firearms under United States law. Big problem. One of the other witnesses to arrive on the scene allowed Carney to borrow his mobile phone just moments after the accident and later reported finding the loaded clip for a large caliber handgun stuffed under his seat, possibly stashed there by Carney in the post-accident chaos. Why did he put the gun in that car? It doesn't make sense. According to other reports, Erickson handed over an Austrian-built 40 caliber Glock pistol to the agents in the Black Hummer. What other evidence allegedly DHS agents may have collected? We'll never know. At one point during the roadside investigation, Erickson whipped out a business card to show to the cops claiming to be a deputy police commissioner with the San Gabriel Valley Transit Authority. <laughs> What the hell is that? It wasn't even a police badge, it was just a business card. Oh, hey, my name is Craig Lieberman, here's my business card. I'm a, a chief of the Southern California Trash uh, Authority. And what the hell is a San Gabriel Transit Authority? Security guards for buses? Don't bother dropping me a comment. I know the laws regarding private transit agencies and what they can do and what they can't do. So I'm just being facetious. This took the investigation into another turn and look, they started looking at the founder of this small obscure agency, a fellow by the name of Yusuf Maiwandi, whose house in Sierra Madre, California, was raided by 25 federal agents in March of 2006. And Maiwandi soon found him in, in jail for perjury charges and other charges. And this case was getting weirder and weirder by the minute. <laughs> But basically what we found out later on was the whole accident scene investigation was just botched. Here's how, well, despite the fact that Erickson was still drunk and despite the fact that he had illegal drugs and weapons were found in the car, Erickson, by the way, was a known cocaine user and had a convictions for that. They were not able to find any evidence of someone else driving the car, meaning that Erickson must have been driving the car. With all this evidence, why was he not arrested? We already know the answer to that. Rich people don't get arrested unless they basically kill somebody in front of the cops. And even if they do, they're out of jail with a couple days. And that's just the beginning of the story. With, within days, more started to unravel to the story. Scotland Yard, you've probably heard of that, that agency. They got involved when they learned that the car belonged to a Scottish bank called Capital Bank, who, as it turns out, were looking for his car and uh, the several other cars that he was at, that had here in California. It seems that Erickson was allegedly leasing cars overseas and then stopping payments and shipping the cars to America. Wait. You can bring in stolen exotics in the United States, but not an R34 GTR? We need to overthrow this government. <laughs> it sucks. On March 29, 2006, got more interesting. Nicole Person, Erickson's fiance at the time, was pulling over uh, while driving a 2005 Mercedes-Benz SLR McLaren. Hmm, 
She was pulled over because the officer found the car's European license plates suspicious. If you've been in Southern California, well, you know that everybody drives with out-of-state or out-of-country plates. It was discovered that person did not even have a valid driver's license. She's rolling dirty just like her boy. With a little investigation, the police found the car to be unregistered, carrying British license plates, and it was illegal exported from Britain. This footage right here shows the actual incident where the car got uh, pulled over and then put on a tow truck. Further investigation then revealed that the crash red Ferrari, a second black Ferrari, and two other Mercedes-Benz cars were also unregistered and illegally exported and residing at the house where Erickson was living. The value of those five cars was over $10 million and they were all leased in Britain and the payments had not been made. Moreover, Erickson hadn't been making the lease payments for the cars for months. After these cars were exported to the United States, the Mercedes was reported stolen in Britain and the lien holder got an insurance payout. So this guy is rolling around with the car free and free and clear basically right but of course stolen footage of erickson and his black ferrari shot by the founders of a car enthusiast website called carparopsy.com was held as evidence against him by the european authorities to prove that those cars had been illegally exported and they were stolen erickson's partner in crime literally was his business partner from the gizmondo days those were the days when erickson and freer had racked up 300 million dollars in debt while taking in three less than three million dollars for their business they were just using that money their investors money for their own lifestyle gizmondo Mondo was a gadget that wanted to be the next Game Boy, if you don't know about that. But it was basically going to be more than the big Game Boy. It was going to be a console, a PDA, a GPS unit, a digital camera, and a bunch of other stuff. But it was basically a device that was just poorly constructed and full of glitches. It had like 14 games, and the thing kept crashing. It was just rubbish. So as the company spiraled and unpaid bills lined up, Freer and Erickson decided to leave Britain, come to Los Angeles, leaving a trail of private detectives, bodyguards, and $1,500 a day lap dancers and million dollars worth of homes and cars diamond watches and other accoutrements of those who get rich quick they took everything they could pack and get over here and the fervor around gizmondo's spectacular failure intensified in february of 2006 and it came to a head when erickson's spectacular 162 mile an hour crash of the enzo made global news court appointed liquidators quickly combed through the thousands of pages of gizmondo document but no one knows where all the money went or how Erickson and Freer transplanted their personal wealth and reinvented themselves in California. Wow, <laughs> this is some James Bond stuff. Financial investigators were also examining why investors and Gizmondo's parent company, the Florida-based Tiger Telematics Incorporated, were not even aware that Erickson was a felon as were at least two other executives connected to uh, the Gizmondo company. Police raided Erickson's Bel Air home on April 8, 2006. Erickson was literally packing his bags preparing to leave the United States, but was arrested on a bevy of charges including embezzlement, uh, grand theft auto, drunken driving, cocaine possession, and weapons charges stemming from another handgun that they found in his residence in Bel Air. This guy just doesn't get it, man. One close associate said this of the incident. You gotta be really stupid when you crash a million dollar car you're driving at almost 200 miles an hour while drunk with gun and a cocaine and documents that you're not supposed to have all inside the car along with a fake police badge we're not supposed to have and you're not a citizen, you don't even have a visa and you have a criminal record and you don't even leave the country right after that. You know, I think he was alluding to the fact that maybe he should just gone home, packed a bag, and get out of the United States. And then he goes on to say, these guys were so stupid they thought they could get away with all of it. And the worst part is, they videotaped the whole thing, the whole entire night of racing around Southern California, Los Angeles, West Los Angeles, PCH. Erickson initially faced up to 14 years in prison, which was later reduced in a plea bargain. Surprise, surprise. In May of 2006, charges of misdemeanor hit and run and driving without a California license and insurance were added in relation to an incident with the Porsche Cayenne, allegedly driven by Erickson, involved in a rear-end accident near his Bel Air home on January 4th of 2006. On November 3rd of 2006, a mistrial was declared after a two-week trial when the jury was deadlocked 10 to 2 and they were leaning towards convicting Erickson. And while the pr prosecution had indicated their intent to retry the case before that happened, Erickson accepted a plea bargain for three years in jail and deportation. He pleaded guilty to two counts of embezzlement, one count of illegal gun possession. I think that was it, right? By doing that, he avoided the auto theft charge, and Erickson did a couple years in prison. He was released in January of 2008. He was quickly deported back to Sweden, where he soon received an 18-month prison sentence. <laughs> for other convictions for extortion and aggravated assault after pouring gasoline on a person 
who was a target of his debt collection services. Oh yeah, he was in the debt collection business. In October of 2014, he was facing further charges of possession of cocaine and other drugs and driving under the influence of drugs. <laughs> get it, man. Erickson is a career criminal and his troubles go back three decades. In the early 1990s, Erickson became the head of a group that Swedish press dubbed the Upsal, Uppsala Mafia, Uppsala Mob, which is a, was responsible at the time for high profile violent crimes up until then rarely seen in that country. So basically Swedish Mafia. He was known as a playboy. He often showed off his 1200 horsepower Sea Ray offshore race boat with a top speed of like 64 miles an hour. He'd like to brag about that. He named that boat Snow White, a reference to the white booger sugar that Ericsson is alleged to love so very much. <sighs> this guy's like the Swedish Scarface. His Mercedes SL had a license plate that read Geo in Swedish, which is pronounced similar to the Cuban slang Yeo, which is, uh, means cocaine, the reference that Al Pacino used in the 1983 movie called Scarface. And hiding behind a company named back in the day called Canon Debt to Collectors, the group collected debts using threats and violence. <laughs> This is like something out of The Sopranos now. They established a reputation very early by dressing in expensive suits and holding business meetings in exclusive Stockholm hotels. So basically hookers and blow. <laughs> so living the American dream, right? Attempting to defraud the Swedish bank a Giro Centro of 22 million kroner, Ericsson and the other future executive of Gizmondo were found guilty of fraud and counterfeiting in the early 1990s. I think it was like 1992 or 1993. And so in 1993 and 1994, Ericsson was sentenced to 10 years in prison, though he only served half of his sentence. Uh, it's nice to see Sweden is very liberal with their sentences, just like this country is. Court documents show that Ericsson and a partner broke into a man's home, destroyed his property and punched him in the face <laughs> repeatedly apparently and uh, that was part of the charges. Erickson allegedly also held a knife to the man's throat, threatened to cut off his fingers and finally shoved the gun into the man's mouth. What a sweetheart of a guy. He sounds nice. I wonder how he treats his ladies. I do remember seeing Erickson at a local car show here back in Southern California around mid to late 2005 and as usual the social climbers were on his jock faster than Monica Lewinsky on a cigar. But this story has a happy ending though. The car that Ericsson wrecked was sent back to Ferrari where it was meticulously rebuilt. It turns out that the Enzo is such a rare car that Ferrari has decided that no matter how badly damaged it is, it's too important to just write off so they rebuild the thing. In fact, they said even if you just have a couple of nuts and bolts left over, they're going to rebuild the car. It's a fact, look it up, I'm not, I'm not bullshit, look it up. And so in the intervening years since Ericsson's escapades, the utterly demolished, Enzo, chassis number 135564, was eventually restored to better than new condition and even gained some op options that were never even on the original model. Things like a navigation system and a backup camera. The car is now black, basically reversing the colors instead of being red on the outside and black on the inside. Now it's black on the outside and red on the inside. And the whole thing has been certified by Ferrari Classic, the automaker's in-house car restoration and authentication service. So what this means is that as far as the California DMV is concerned, this Enzo was never turned into carbon confetti on a California your coastline highway and in 2016 the, the now fully repaired car which it had just 2500 kilometers on the odometer it went on the auction block at an rm sotheby's event held in paris and this reborn enzo sold for 1.75 million dollars and to think some of us resist salvage title cars <laughs> <laughs> That's all for this episode, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow, subscribe, and sign up for uh, uh, notifications. Don't forget to check my merch store. And if you have any questions and so forth, go ahead and put them in the comments. I usually answer the comments for the first 24 hours, and then, then, the, then the trolls come in after that. I pretty much ignore them. But if you really need to reach me, you can get me on Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.